Paris, the city of light, the flower of Europe, was about to fall again. This time some of the troops headed for the city were indeed Frenchmen, being part of the French 2nd Armoured Division. Our 4th Infantry Division was held back, for political reasons, to let the native division go in ahead. We were, nonetheless, the first American troops to enter Paris on August 25, 1944, an incredible, indelible day. It was exactly one month after my first day in combat. Within the city itself, all was confusion and wild celebration. The population had gone insane with jubilation. We stayed in our vehicles and slowly moved through the crowded streets on our way toward the Eiffel Tower. Small cars with FFI, French forces of the interior, painted in bold white letters on their sides, sped around corners. Young, wild-looking French men and women hung from every window of the cars. They waved hysterically and brandished weapons as they passed. We were afraid we might become their targets. I guess they were all right, but somehow we did not trust them very much. It was little chilling to watch some of our Sherman tanks, now in the hands of this French 2nd Armoured Division, wander all over the road. The drivers were either too drunk or too excited to keep in line. What a nightmare for a traffic cop, a drunken driver in a Sherman tank. We really didn't blame them, after their four years in exile or underground. Then we were on the Champs-Élysées, and it was packed with insanely joyous Parisians. Men, women and children hung precariously from every window and jammed every doorway. The streets were almost a solid wall of humanity, and our trucks could barely crawl through them. These people shouted and cheered at the top of their voices in sheer ecstasy. In a desperate attempt to thank us for freeing their lovely city, they tossed us flowers, candy, cookies, bottles of wine, and other things they really could not spare. They just could not find enough good things to shower upon us. The young French girls threw kisses, and many were able to climb aboard our trucks and give the GIs the real thing. Our boys hated to let them go. I shook so many outstretched hands that my arm ached. One French blonde clambered into the cab of one of our trucks and settled onto the lap of a sergeant and kissed him. The sergeant must have figured that was unmilitary behaviour, for he promptly pushed her back into the crowd. It was many, many weeks before the men let him forget it. We pushed right on through the centre of the city to the northeast corner, which was much calmer. There we were assigned areas for bivouac and cautioned not to wander, since there were still Germans about. I had my men pitch tents in some backyards and told them to stay put. Less than an hour later, you might know, two men from another platoon wandered off in search of wine and women. They immediately ran into Germans instead. One of them was shot in the exchange of fire, and the other fled back to the company. He ran into an officer on the street and excitedly told him what had happened. The officer at once grabbed all the men he could load onto a jeep and took off up the road after the Germans. Very quickly he ran into the Germans and found himself in a small arms fight that was too big for his small group. Without telling the men, the officer jumped in the jeep and tore back to our lines for more support. My company was then ordered to attack. We marched up the road about a half mile, passing our dead GI, who was sprawled by the side of the road where he had fallen. As we approached a railroad yard and roundhouse where the Germans seemed to be holed up, I was ordered to take my platoon on a right-flanking move and attack on signal to take the roundhouse. We manoeuvred behind houses and through backyards until we were in position, and I radioed that we were ready. Instead of being ordered to attack, I was told to withdraw back to the company area. I was told only that there had been a change in plans. We learned later that we had been led into another regiment's combat zone. This neighbouring regiment had almost let us have it with their artillery. Fortunately for us, their artillery forward observer was on the ball and recognised us as friendlies. The next day, I witnessed one of the emotion-ridden French kangaroo courts. There were several defendants, mostly women, on trial for collaboration with the Germans. As each was convicted in about five minutes, she was led out onto the porch of a large house, and a local barber shaved her head. At the end of the trial, the convicted were lined up and forced to march through the streets. Their shaven heads made them stand out, and the mob jeered and poked at them and pelted them with rotten eggs, tomatoes, and even paper bags of excrement. Many such trials were going on around us, we heard. The retribution was beastly. 
With their bare scalps, these people were marked for a long time. They had to struggle and beg for the essentials of life. If guilty, perhaps they were lucky. Some of these luckless people might have been trying to make the best of a desperate situation. Some of the women had two and three children fathered by Germans. Others believed their husbands had been killed and so had fallen in love with their captors. For those, on the other hand, who had suffered without collaborating through four years of privation and hunger, the sudden release was emotionally explosive. To them, it was not a time to grant mercy they themselves had been denied. It reminded me of an occasion back in Normandy, when we actually had to shoot a Frenchwoman because she was firing at us. It seems the father of her children was a German soldier, and he had been killed right in the yard of their farmhouse. Near the end of the war, I saw the long trains of forty and eight boxcars. The capacity of each was stenciled on its side. Forty hommes, eight chevaux, forty men or eight horses. Each was loaded with Frenchmen heading for home after four years in Germany as slave labour. I wondered if they had any idea what awaited them. They all were riotously happy. After only a day or two on the northeast side of Paris, we again took up the pursuit of the Germans. We started out on foot in two columns on either side of the road, with my platoon in the lead. At the far edge of town we came upon a large villa enclosed by a stone wall. The huge house had a nice stand of tall pines in front, and the Germans had not failed to build platforms close to the treetops so that they could observe our actions. East of the villa stretched a huge sugar beet field, and beyond that a hayfield. Artillery shells began to land among the trees where we stood, and we spotted some Germans out in the beet field about a quarter mile away. Lieutenant Colonel Walker ordered my platoon right out into the open field to clear it out. I sure didn't like being that sort of sacrificial offering, so I asked him to shell the Germans as we went out. In a few minutes our shells began to land among the Germans, and I led the platoon out into the sugar beet field. Our artillery soon became too much for the enemy, and they began waving white flags. I had my men hold their fire, and we waved to the Germans to come on in and surrender as soon as we could stop our artillery from firing on them. About thirty of them got up and came toward us with their hands on their heads. We covered them until they reached us, and then passed them on to the rear as prisoners. For them, the war was over. We continued our advance across the open field. It was a very tense business. We were so completely exposed. At one point I just missed stepping on a terrible anti-personnel mine we called a bouncing betty. Three tiny prongs showed through the earth about three inches from my foot. I instantly yelled, Mines! and told my men to watch where they walked. Those things really scared the hell out of me. They were completely hidden, very deadly. They work in two stages. Stepping on one of those prongs or touching a tripwire with five pounds of pressure sets off the first stage. The mine shoots up like a small rocket, and when it's about ten to twenty feet high it explodes again. The second explosion scatters hundreds of ball bearings in every direction, like a shotgun. No one is safe within 40 yards of the device. The second explosion is so close to the first you hardly have time to move. Falling down, which is the natural reflex, just exposes more of the body. Somehow we made it all the way across the sugar beet field and then far into some hay fields where we stopped for the night. At least we were able to make comfortable beds among the haystacks. About this time, a solitary Frenchman wandered by. It seemed he owned a small fleet of buses and the Germans had taken them all in their escape from Paris. He knew they were short on gas, and he hoped to find them abandoned and unharmed along the road. We wished him luck. Paris was now safely in Allied hands, and the rest of the pursuit was ahead. I hoped our luck would hold out. My platoon actually had not lost a man since Saint-Pois. With Paris behind us and the German armies in full retreat, we tossed all caution to the wind. Combat teams were thrown together by mixing a few tanks with each infantry battalion. The infantry rode on the back of the tanks or followed in two-and-a-half-ton trucks. A wild, mad, exciting race seemed to be on to see which army could gain the most ground in a single day. We were in the first army under General Hodges. The headline hailed the colourful, flamboyant Patton as the hero of the day, boldly announcing, Patton's tanks roll fifty miles. While our first army usually made about the same distance, we were not mentioned. Or if anything was said, 
It was usually hidden on a second or third page of Stars and Stripes, the army newspaper. Back home, too, the bold headlines were all about Patton. He did deserve a lot of credit, but we resented the neglect of the First Army and the efficient General Hodges. He never received the credit he deserved. Resistance continued to be very light, and we were able to gain 50 or 60 miles each day. The German rear echelon blew up a few bridges and toppled some trees across the roads at points difficult to detour. Places with a hill on one side and a ravine on the other were ideal for that type of roadblock. Usually the Germans did not defend those roadblocks, but you had to assume they were mined or an anti-tank gun was hidden somewhere, or you might get caught in a trap and lose some men or equipment. Sometimes we travelled all day without any action. Ironically enough, we now crossed some old World War I battlegrounds that we recognised from historical markers or statues. One city I remember was Soissons. Many of our men had fought and died in its vicinity some 25 years earlier. Somehow, being on the scene, it all seemed so unreal. Theirs was the war dedicated to end all wars. Yet here we were on the very same scene again. Perhaps members of Congress should serve automatically as frontline troops. Surely such top-notch intelligent men could find a way to stop wars much sooner if they were directly involved. It seems the young men are destined to carry out, mostly without question, the plans and orders of their seniors. It was near Soissons after dark that we heard our first buzz bombs fly overhead. We had been reading about their hitting London, and now we heard them roar over and saw the afterglow of their rocket motors. It was spooky. Our advance continued toward Belgium and Germany, retracing the paths of the Allies of World War I. Near the French-Belgian border, a German regiment came out to stop us. In this particular action, my outfit enjoyed the luxury of being spectators. We stayed right in our trucks and watched our fighter planes dive at the enemy ahead with all eight 50 calibre machine guns blazing away from each plane with a fearful deafening clatter. We also heard our tanks joining in with their cannon and machine guns. The terrifying noises pressed upon our senses, and I think we would have been almost paralysed had we been on the receiving end. The battle was over in what seemed only a few minutes, and soon a babbling mixture of local civilians and wounded Germans streamed toward us in carts and wagons. Everyone was confused and excited, and there seemed to be no order. Some women wearing Red Cross armbands and aprons hurried out of a nearby village to help the wounded. Some of the litter cases were carried into houses, and the walking wounded cluttered around outside, awaiting their turns. At the height of the turmoil, our truck column began to move ahead through the village, and this only stirred up the weltering mess. The German regiment that met up with our air force and tanks had been in the woods north of the village, and as we came among the trees, I could hardly believe my eyes. Dead German soldiers and dead and wounded horses and wrecked wagons were scattered all along the road. The equipment for this unit must have been left over from World War I. Everything was horse-drawn. The equipment may have been dated, but it was beautiful, and this I appreciated, for I had been partly raised on a farm. I was amazed at such superb draft horses and accoutrements. The harness work was by far the finest I had ever seen. The leather was high-polished, and all the brass rivets and hardware shone brightly. The horses had been groomed with tails bobbed as though for a parade. Some of the horses were still alive, though crippled, and our men mercifully shot them as we drove by. This was one of the worst massacres I ever witnessed. I'm sure even the fighter pilots had no idea of their awesome destructive power. We were lucky our own columns had not been attacked by German planes, though the closer we got to the fatherland, the more we expected it to happen. Many of the Germans had run deep into the woods to escape our planes, and our regiment now had the job of surrounding the huge area. Our company had to cover a wide stretch of meadow farmland along one perimeter of the forest, and we dug foxholes for the night. Fences divided the pastures, ending at the edge of the woods. We placed machine guns to cover the fences, because they were partly overgrown by small bushes. In this way we could defend the only escape route for the enemy, straight through our lines. A herd of beautiful Holstein cows was grazing peacefully along the edge of the woods. Toward evening, the Belgian farmer, his wife and a hired man came out into the pasture, dragging carts loaded with 10-gallon milk cans, 
and they began to milk the cows right out there in the open field. One of our GIs grabbed his canteen cup and ran over and asked for a cup of fresh milk. He mixed in some K-ration chocolate powder, took a sip, and broke out into a big grin. More GI Joes decided this was a good deal, and soon a line formed from the cows back across the whole platoon area. Men from neighbouring platoons also got the idea, and before long the farmer had given away all his milk. He seemed pretty philosophical about it, however, as he headed back to the farmhouse with his empty milk cans. Before he left, I had my interpreter suggest to him it would be better if he moved his cows elsewhere for the night. I told him we expected the trapped Germans to try to break through us during the night, and that some of his cows might get shot. He expressed his thanks, but added that he didn't have any other place to put them. During the night, a few Germans actually did try to escape. One even got all the way through our lines, and the last I saw of him, he was running like a deer, clearing the fences in stride as rifle bullets whizzed all around him. I don't know where he was headed, but it was in the wrong direction to get home. I was up repeatedly during the night to check on the gunfire by my men. The machine guns pointed down the fence row were very busy. The guys were trigger happy, nervously firing at any sound to their front. Most of the time I could not find anything they thought they were firing at, and I cautioned them to be careful of the cows. At daybreak we found we had killed two cows and wounded two others. I sent the interpreter back to break the news to the farmer, with the suggestion that he bring the equipment to butcher them and thus save most of the meat. Our medic took a look at the wounded animals, a change of pace for him. His professional opinion was that one cow would have to be put away, but that the other would recover from a small flesh wound. We were very distressed about this nice farmer's losses, for he had been kind to us. Some our men helped him butcher the cows, and he was able to save most of the meat. There was nothing more we could do. Just about then I was ordered to lead a patrol into the woods to see what could be stirred up. We didn't find any more Germans, but we did find out why they had thrown up so much resistance. Deep in the woods a series of tremendous log warehouses had been dug in the ground, they were filled with all kinds of supplies, plus a lot of ammo. The spiffy horse and wagon unit must have been attached there. With some difficulty, we discovered a small network of very cleverly camouflaged roads and a rail spur that serviced the huge arsenal. I reported the storage depot to the CO, but no one seemed interested, and soon we were back on the trucks again, headed generally northeastward across Belgium. At one small town in Belgium, we arrived just a few minutes too late. The Germans had rounded up a dozen or so people, mostly teenaged boys, and shot them down in cold blood. It seems the victims were suspected of being in an underground group, and their fate was intended as a lesson to the community. It was getting dark by then, so we stayed in the little town overnight. I slept in one of the homes as a guest. Much to my dismay, I heard later that it was a house in which one of the dead boys had lived. They had not mentioned their loss when we asked to stay. You could tell there was some grief, but I assumed it was for all of the poor kids slain. They did not mourn as you would expect a family who had just lost a son to do. They tried very hard to make us welcome. When I learned of their loss the next morning, I expressed my regrets as best I could. After a K-ration breakfast, we moved on. I did not know then that we were very close to where the Battle of Waterloo had been fought between Napoleon and Wellington. Much blood had been spilled there in three wars in little more than a hundred years. Our orders were suddenly changed shortly after we crossed into Belgium, but before we reached Bastogne. Perhaps we were getting closer to Germany and a stronger defence, or maybe our trucks were getting low on gas. Regardless of the reason, most of our regiment now had to move on foot. My platoon was not so lucky, as we were given a new job. The new assignment required me and my men to get out in front of the rest of the infantry and clear out any pockets of resistance we found as quickly as possible. To add to our punch, we were given a platoon of five Sherman tanks and four tank destroyers, plus enough jeeps for my 40-man rifle platoon to ride in. Most of the jeeps had .30 caliber machine guns mounted on the hood, but one had a pedestal-mounted .50 caliber machine gun. Thus, all of a sudden, I found myself the rifle platoon leader of a miniature task force under the command of Lieutenant Tolles. We moved out on a winding easterly course toward the Siegfried Line from near Saint-Vith, Belgium. 
I had no idea how far we had to go or how soon we might get some action. I was also not aware of the overall situation and so did not know at the time that we were the point of the right column of our regiment and that another unit was in a similar position a few miles to our left, north of us. Our column went through one small village after another. The people there, as in much of Europe, seemed to draw their houses together in small clusters two or three miles apart. They would farm the outreaching fields around them. Most of the population of the villages stood by the side of the road and waved as we went by. In this area of Belgium we were most welcome, and the faces of the men and women showed their warmth. It was interesting to see the changes in expression as we moved closer to the German border. The faces by the side of the road grew much tighter, and smiles became rare. Then nervous uncertainty appeared in their expressions, and a hint of fear. At first the fright was evident in only a few, then it showed in about half the expressions and finally nearly everyone stared straight ahead with frozen faces, too afraid to look us in the eye, fearful of more fighting in their village. The Germans had overrun the same area in World War I. After a while we came to the tiny village of Owl, on the banks of a branch of the Auer River, meandering through a valley in the village. As we approached its small bridge, there was suddenly a quick flash and a ripping explosion, and the bridge disappeared in a cloud of debris. As soon as the sounds of the blast died away, we heard the roar of a heavy motor speeding away. At that moment I was standing near the front of one of our tank destroyers staring at the road ahead, and I was almost knocked flat by the concussion when its 90mm gun started rapid fire. Window panes in the houses were scattered all around. I staggered to the rear of the TD to get away from all that noise. The blasting stopped in a few seconds, but it was some time before my hearing returned and I could understand the TD commander's report. It seems they had picked off an enemy half-track speeding away up a winding road. The range was 1,600 yards, nearly a mile, and the target must have been tearing along about 40 miles per hour. To me it was incredible marksmanship, better than a rifleman might have done at 400 yards. I really didn't believe the claim until I saw the smoking half-track. After we forded the small river, we became very cautious indeed as we pushed ahead. It seemed highly questionable to me to be leading the column with defenceless jeeps, but the tankers and TD men argued that jeeps were faster, more manoeuvrable and more expendable. This did make sense, though I didn't like the word expendable. I put the jeep with the .50 caliber machine gun in the lead with Crocker, my best scout. My jeep was next in line followed by the other jeeps and then the armour. Crocker stayed about 200 yards ahead of me, and the other vehicles followed at 30-yard intervals. Our pace was now a discreet 20 miles per hour, with frequent stops to check out potential enemy positions. Once, when we came around a curve in the road, we spotted a few Germans in the woods to our left. The men piled out of the jeeps and started shooting. At the same time, someone swung the .30 caliber machine gun on my jeep to the left and opened up without looking. This stream of bullets knocked the rifle out of the hands of one of the other men, scaring the devil out of him, but not touching him otherwise. He lost all his colour, and I thought he was going to faint, but instead he quickly snapped out of it and got really mad. Then someone laughed, and the tension was broken. Meanwhile, the enemy took off back over a hill, and we resumed our advance. Having seen enemy soldiers at Owl and again on the ridge beyond, we now approached the next town, Winterspelt, with extreme caution. This was fairly open country, easy for long-range enemy fire, I was thinking, so I decided to hold up the column about a half mile out and sent Crocker in alone in the lead jeep. As Crocker's jeep got close to the edge of town, it stopped, and everyone scrambled out and ran up to a small orchard on their right. A moment later, one of the men ran back to the jeep and radioed for us to come on in. He said they had just caught a German anti-tank gun crew asleep and captured all of them. I couldn't help wondering how many men we might have lost if that gun crew had stayed awake. Our luck was still with us. An anti-tank gun would disintegrate a jeep with one shot. The rest of the unit moved into the town immediately and the men began a house-to-house -house search for enemy soldiers. There was no sign of civilians, and there were no white flags showing, as there would have been had the military left. 
We could all feel the enemy's presence, and the eerie sensation built up as we nervously awaited the first shot. The spell was partially broken by a crusty old German-Belgian farmer who issued from a house on our left and began to saunter across the road in front of us, clanking a couple of empty milk cans. We stopped this character, and our interpreter asked him where the Kraut soldiers were. He spat on the ground, shuffled his feet, and said that they had all left the day before. This old rascal was a pretty good actor, and wasn't about to give us any info, so we let him go. I still felt that there were Germans close by, and I began to examine the road ahead through my binoculars. A building stood about 200 yards ahead, and against its side were some German bicycles with the usual gas mask canisters on their rear fenders. German soldiers did not usually leave their bicycles behind. We continued to work down the road, searching each building along the way. All we came across were pitifully scared civilians, usually huddled together in a back room or cellar. They had no way of knowing we wouldn't harm them. I wondered how many times the war had passed their front doors. Quite a bit of small arms ammunition turned up, plus some anti-tank shells, gasoline and food rations. And in one shed, we came upon the half-track that had towed the anti-tank gun we'd captured at the edge of town. Once Private First Class Crocker and another man, who was always very aggressive, spotted a couple of Germans running from a barn into the house with the bicycles parked alongside. Crocker quickly emptied his rifle through the door, reloaded, and then, without waiting for help, jerked the door open. He stepped over a dead German soldier by the door, glanced at the terrified old civilian couple cringing in a corner of the room, and unhesitatingly followed a track of blood up the stairs. There he found two unarmed Kraut soldiers hiding under a bed, and he ordered them to come out with their hands up, or he'd toss in a grenade. They may not have understood his poor German, but they did understand his manner, and they quickly surrendered. When next I saw Crocker, he was coming down the road with his prisoners in tow. One of the prisoners had blood running down his arm and was begging to lower his arm, but Crocker just prodded him with his rifle and made him keep moving. Winterspelt was a border town, and the prisoners told us they were home on furlough. Later, when I had time, I recommended Crocker for a bronze star for his bold actions. The men were ready to go into action again across the road because they'd heard movement in the basement and couldn't get anyone to come out, but I restrained them because I suspected scared civilians. I had the interpreter yell down that if they didn't come up, we'd throw down a grenade. Sure enough, five pitifully frightened old men and women came crawling up the stairs. They had been told the American soldiers would kill the men and rape the women. We tried as best we could to assure them they had nothing to fear from us. I was grateful my own parents and grandparents would not have to go through this sort of terror. Just as we were ready to leave town, a tank sergeant yelled at me from his open turret. He told me to take a quick look at the ox team near a farmhouse a half mile ahead. My binoculars showed a team of oxen plodding along with a two-wheeled cart loaded with household goods. Their route passed along across my front from left to right. A careful study revealed signs of another vehicle on the far side of the ox cart, hiding behind it. I asked the sergeant if he had any idea what the hidden vehicle was, and he said, Yes, sir. It must be the half-track we saw going behind a building when we first came up here. We didn't have time to get a shot off then. Well, you've got time now. Go to it, I told him. The sergeant just grinned. His first round blew up the ox cart, and his second got the half-track which was trying to streak away. It seemed a shame to blow up the ox cart, but the war was not a game, and the ox cart was not being put to innocent use. When I radioed in my position at the next road junction, I was ordered to hold up and await further instructions. I suppose they were trying to decide which direction we should take. The equipment was pulled over to the edge of the road, and the men had all taken cover in the tall grass on the right shoulder of the road. Suddenly, a German motorcycle with a sidecar appeared on the road coming in our direction. I waited until he was almost on top of us before ordering the men nearest me to jump up and stop him. The motorcycle came to an abrupt halt. Both Germans quickly threw up their hands in surrender. I ordered them to dismount. The driver stood up and came forward immediately. The corporal in the sidecar rose slowly, stepped up on the seat of the bike, and then fell astride the bike and gunned its motor full speed, 
and headed down the road toward Germany. He only made it some twenty feet down the road. The sharp, deadly crack of several rifles broke through the roar of the motorcycle, and the corporal slumped over dead. His back was riddled with bullets. The other German just shook his head in dismay and wonderment at the daring but stupid attempt to escape. In any event, the war was over for both of them. Our next town was Grossbangenfeld, a pleasant little hamlet. We did not find any German soldiers there, but did corn across an English-speaking woman with a two-way radio. She got very indignant. In fact, she cussed me out splendidly when, for obvious military reasons, I ordered her radio destroyed. Meanwhile, our private crocker was having difficulty with the .50 caliber machine gun. It jammed too easily and apparently needed headspace adjustments. I tried my hand at the repair and told Crocker to go out to the edge of town and fire it a few times to try it out. Soon we could hear the .50 caliber machine gun in rapid fire, as expected, but there came some rather insistent rifle fire as well. It seems that two Kraut soldiers had just rounded a small bend in the road headed for town when the .50 caliber machine gun opened its practice fire. Both of them dumped their bicycles and rolled into the ditch with their hands raised. The one farther back suddenly decided to make a break. He jumped a small fence and ran like hell down through a little orchard. The rifleman opened fire, but the German was too evasive and got away. He probably would have been better off as a prisoner. The captured man was so frightened, he shook convulsively and his forehead was beaded with sweat. Then he began to jabber in a foreign language and gesticulate as though he were begging for his life. When one of the men began speaking to him in Polish, the prisoner quieted down. Once the prisoner was convinced he was not going to be harmed, he began to talk. He was a Russian forced into the German army after his capture. He was told the Americans would shoot him as a spy if he surrendered, and he was threatened constantly by the German who always rode behind him with orders to shoot him if he failed to do his job. He told us he was the lead scout of a bicycle company coming up the road to fight us, and he said they were only a few hundred yards behind. The poor guy was frantic, almost berserk with fear. I quickly moved men and tanks into defensive positions, hoping the Germans would blunder over the little hill to our front. When they didn't appear after a few minutes, I sent a few jeeps with machine guns to explore the road up to the next curve. In a few minutes, they radioed back that they had found a lot of bicycle tyre tracks in the road where the Germans had turned around and headed for home. Apparently, they had been warned by the clatter of the .50 caliber machine gun and rifle fire. When their scouts disappeared, they knew their bicycles and rifles were no match against us, especially if they had spotted our tanks and TDs. We could hardly blame them for leaving. By now, we had the feeling that the Siegfried line couldn't be too far ahead. We came down a long slope and passed what appeared to be a railroad freight yard with a small station that bore the sign Bleolf. We could see the town buildings about a half mile to the northeast. The rail tracks led northward into a tunnel, and we discovered the tunnel had been widened for machine shops and appeared safe from bombing. The machinery, plus any war material, evidently had been moved very recently. You could see where machines had been positioned before the wires had been cut so that they could be moved. Some of us went into the beer hall across the road from the tunnel, and as we entered, something made a noise behind the counter. My Browning automatic rifleman began shooting without questioning. He ripped off his entire twenty-round clip into the bar, but to his regret, all he hit was bottles, cest la guerre. When our eyes got accustomed to the dim lighting, we spotted a young woman and an old man, both very frightened by the shooting, hiding in a corner. They were father and daughter, slave labour from Poland. She had been a teacher, and she spoke several languages, including English and German. Her father was ill, and she had hidden him when the Germans had moved out all of the machines and other people a few days before. She also told us we were getting very close to the Siegfried line, which was not much more than a mile away. She had been there several times with German officers. She was sure the line was occupied, and she volunteered that the bicycle outfit had come from there. We passed all this information back to the rear, and then were told to go on into Bleolf with extreme caution. We stayed on the road and went past a rather large butter factory, and right on into the centre of town, marked by a church and a cobblestone square.
I was greatly surprised that we had no trouble, for there were several excellent defensive positions. The road eastward toward Sellerich was a long, winding incline, and halfway up the hill I stopped the column and very gingerly walked the rest of the way up, taking one man with me. There was considerable cover from underbrush and scrub pine along the way. We had to go a bit beyond the crest before we could get a clear view of our road winding down the hill and across a small valley, only to disappear into the thick pine forest beyond. I lay on the ground and used my field glasses to very carefully study every inch of the little valley and the edge of the thick woods. At first I saw nothing at all, then a slight movement caught my eye. A couple of German soldiers were cutting wood with an axe partway up the slope, right in the edge of the woods. One guy picked up an armload and disappeared behind a door that seemed to open into the side of the hill. I fixed my eye on the spot and saw the door open again, and the man came out for more wood. Now I could clearly make out a mound of earth and the outline of gun emplacements. This fortification was just across the valley, and only about 100 yards from the road. Suddenly my stomach turned a little, and I got a slight chill as I realised I might well be the first American to set eyes on a pillbox in the famous Siegfried line. The earthen mounds looked like piles of dirt with tufts of grass and bushes on top. Darker spots apparently were doors or windows cut into the earth. I could not see any cement or guns, but we found out later they were very much there under that pile of earth. Cement walls eight feet thick with roofs ten to twelve feet thick. I was able to spot several more mounds that might have been pillboxes covered with earth and grass. Huge iron doors were slightly ajar, and there was no longer any question in my mind that this was indeed the Siegfried line. Using my compass, I took azimuth readings for each pillbox, marking them on my map. Then we crawled back over the hill to our vehicles and radioed headquarters of my find. I was told to wait there for further orders. Luckily for us, from what I heard later, Colonel Lanham's original orders never reached us. I never found out if he changed his mind or whether the orders somehow went astray. Friends told me he had originally wanted me to go right over the hill and attack the pillboxes to find out how well they were defended. I suppose I was flattered he thought my small combat team could do this, but I don't see how we could have attempted it alone and come out alive. Finally, around dusk, I received orders to pull back and rejoin E Company south of Blayolf. Some other unit in our regiment got credit for being first to cross the German border, but I am sure we had to have been the first to see the Siegfried line. At least our regiment, the 22nd Infantry, got credit for being the first on German soil on September 12th. Unit pride was important in those days. We did not know how much or how often we would have to fight there in the next few months. During the night of September 12th to 13th, while I rested from the tense days on point, Colonel Lanham was busy planning to attack the Siegfried line the next morning. He had maps, aerial photos, and the reports from his two-point leaders on the positions of pillboxes, and he would assume the line was fully manned from the information he had received. Colonel Lanham also had an uncompromisingly aggressive nature. He believed the best way to end the war quickly and save lives was to attack and attack. He also believed wholeheartedly that the boys of the 22nd Infantry Regiment shared his spirit that they could do the job if anyone could. The Siegfried line was, to him, more an opportunity than an obstacle. He wanted his regiment to be the first Americans through the line, as they'd already been first across the border into Germany. Plans were to attack east from the vicinity of Boucher. The attack plan was starkly simple. The 3rd Battalion, led by veteran Lieutenant Colonel Teague, was to jump off in column of companies, that is, with one company leading the attack as a point, and the others following one by one in its path. After the penetration, the two other battalions were to follow through the same gap and then turn left and right to attack the neighbouring pillboxes from the rear. It was important to cut a wide swathe through the lines, because each pillbox was close enough to its neighbours that they had overlapping fields of fire. An attack thus drew fire from the pillbox it faced directly, plus crossfire from the pillboxes on each side. The vulnerable part of the pillbox was its rear, the crossfire support did not reach back there, and all they had was some barbed wire and whatever rifles and machine guns could be transferred to the rear trenches. The trick was to get behind a pillbox quickly. 
The lead attack company faced the worst beating, but it was not simply going to walk into the jaws of death. The open ground close to the pillboxes did have some small depressions into which the infantry could duck, and a scattering of small pines and scrub brush offered some cover. The tanks and TDs also were to come up to within 200 to 500 yards of the pillboxes and plaster them with direct cannon fire against their firing apertures and steel doors. Artillery would fire hundreds of rounds onto the same targets. Many of the Germans this would be pinned down and occupied with their own safety, and thus, it was hoped, would not be very effective against us. For close support, right up beside a pillbox, the infantry had two deadly weapons, flamethrowers and satchel charges. The flamethrower was operated by one man with a tank strapped to his back. The flame from the hose was huge, but the man had to get within 10 to 20 yards of his target. If he could get close enough to an aperture, he could blind or suffocate those inside the pillbox. Some of the enemy might also be set on fire. The satchel charge had a long fuse attached to 12 pounds of TNT, six pounds in each side of a saddlebike bag. If it could be set off in one of the pillbox openings, it would kill or stun anyone inside. With both weapons, a man had to get in very close. Dangerous work, but it really paid off. Either close-in weapon could finish off a pillbox, providing the attacker could stay alive long enough to use them. Our splendid 3rd Battalion, Companies 1, K, L and M, was the one Colonel Lanham seemed to use in crucial situations, and they did not fail him this time. They absorbed their casualties and drove a small hole right through the Siegfried, and then they widened it into a wedge. The 1st Battalion followed close behind, and then turned to the left to wipe out the pillboxes on the north from the rear. The bulk of the 3rd Battalion then turned right toward Branscheid, a fortified town astride the Siegfried, almost a mile to the south. Meanwhile, the 2nd Battalion, which included my E Company, kept straight ahead through the gap for over a half mile, then fanned out in two company width, facing southeast across some open fields. The 1st Battalion found it rather easy to take pillboxes from the rear, and they took many prisoners as they headed northward. They advanced as far as reasonable, perhaps a thousand yards, and then consolidated their position. Our job in the 2nd Battalion was even easier. We simply set up a good defence and waited for the enemy to attack, which he failed to do, and that was a break for us. The 3rd Battalion moved smoothly southward, until they hit the heavily defended village of Branscheid and a very tough Kraut battalion. The battle raged on for the next two weeks, and Branscheid never did fall. This little burg was circled by pillboxes, and it just wasn't worth the cost of storming it, so Colonel Teague's men kept plunking away at it to keep it contained. Meanwhile, the 1st Battalion was hit by a very heavy counter-attack and had to fight desperately for a couple of days to keep from being overrun. We in the 2nd Battalion were alerted for a probable counter-attack, but none ever materialised. We did detect a convoy of Germans moving eastward on the Sellerich Road, and I led a patrol to within 30 yards of the road to confirm that they were indeed Jerry's, but nothing was ever done to try and stop them. I found out later that we were really handicapped by lack of supplies, having only enough gas to move each vehicle in the division five miles and we had only one day's supply of ammunition. Colonel Lanham had asked division headquarters to permit him to continue the attack right on through to the Rhine, but division did not have the supplies to support him, and we lacked support from other units for the same reason. Colonel Lanham claimed, and history proved, that no German unit was strong enough to stop us short of the Rhine. It's hard to imagine how many lives might have been saved if our troops had reached the Rhine in September instead of six months later in March. This assumes, of course, that neighbouring divisions would have kept up with us, so that we would not have been cut off. I feel sure they could have if we had all been given the supplies we needed. Eisenhower himself made the decision, allowing only what he called pencil-like thrusts through the Siegfried. We can only hope this was not a major error. We really did not fault the quartermaster people for our supply shortages, because their lines stretched clear back to Cherbourg, and they were just beginning to open up Le Havre. There were ugly rumours, however, that Patton's Third Army was getting more than its share, sometimes even through pirating. It was also believed that the High Command favoured Patton, 
not expecting that Patton would be stopped cold in the Metz Nancy region, nor that Hodges's first army would make such tremendous progress. Too bad hindsight always seems to beat foresight. Meanwhile, we were still in defensive positions deep behind the Siegfried with our E Company on the extreme right. We were about a half mile east of the Siegfried, at the edge of some woods which overlooked a valley just below Sellerich. As the sun came up, we had a clear view of the rolling farmland generally to our southeast. In a little while, we found ourselves with what amounted to grandstand seats for a remarkable panorama of war. Another battalion, perhaps from the 90th Division, moved into the woods about a quarter mile to our right, east of Brandscheid. Soon they began an attack eastward, directly towards Sellerich. They jumped off with two companies abreast and headed down through the valley that led to the hills around Sellerich. The rifle companies were leading, supported by tanks along each side of the Sellerich road. At first everything went exactly by the book as tank infantry teams performed beautifully, wiping out pockets of Germans in their path. We could see every move and hear the continual clatter of the tanks' machine guns and the crack of rifles. We could even hear the excited shouts of men in combat. Maybe it was because we were not used to being spectators, but somehow all the action seemed unreal, almost as though it were a training film. Each unit performed smoothly. They were in full control as the enemy melted away. Then, unexpectedly, German mortars and artillery, which had not been evident up to that point, suddenly came down hard on the infantry and tanks as they reached a small exposed area at a crossroad. There was no cover from the terrible barrage. The Germans knew the exact range and obviously had been waiting for the Americans to reach that point. The American tanks turned and raced back toward the woods to escape the slaughter, panicking the riflemen, who chased after the tanks in confusion. The retreat was an uncontrolled stampede, and a great many casualties were left where they fell. Even at our safe distance we all felt sick. It could so easily have been us. It had taken about 45 minutes for the tank infantry teams to reach the crossroads in the low ground west of Hontium, and the entire gain had been wiped out in less than five minutes. Dead and wounded lay all over the fields, and the officers were fighting desperately to regain control of the survivors. They were now all back in the woods where the attack had begun almost an hour before. Perhaps the Germans were short on ammo too, since they did not follow up their victory by dropping more artillery in the woods. The whole disheartening episode was at least a lesson in the naked power of artillery and its effective use. The Germans had destroyed an attack without committing any of their tanks or infantry. The results could have been much worse if they had followed up with more artillery.